Hello. Welcome to Focus, an operational briefing series by MSF. My name is Chi Hyun Pang from the Communication Department of MSF Korea. Please note that Korean and English simultaneous interpretation is provided for today's event. Please press the interpretation icon on the bottom side of the screen to set your language of preference. Today's focus series was prepared as the final session of a webinar series co-hosted with the International Organization for Migration and Concern Worldwide to commemorate World Humanitarian Day 2023. The series covered resilience amid humanitarian crisis and MSF prepared a webinar on MHPSS, mental health and psychological support in our areas of armed conflict. In today's briefing, we will hear from Mariana Durate, a mental health advisor for MSF, and have a Q&A session to answer the questions you submitted. While listening to the presentation, please leave your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, and we will try to answer them during the Q&A session that will follow after the presentation. Now, I will turn it over to Mariana Durate for her presentation. Hi everyone, um, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you. It's always uh, uh, nice to share uh, about an HPSS, mental health and psychosocial uh, support. Let me just share my screen to start the presentation. So, um, my name is Mariana, as has been introduced, and I'm the mental health advisor for uh, MSF France. So we have worked with um, psychosocial and mental health support in different aspects in different zones. So today the focus is more the humanitarian um, intervention in armed conflict areas. So as you majority of you know, but reminding that MSF um, is, um, is 52 years now and we work with assisting uh, communities and populations uh, with neutrality and dependency without discrimination. So for today, as I said, the priority is going to be to talk a little bit about the PSS in humanitarian field and then I will share in the end a little bit how we MSF properly integrate MHPSS in our programs. So first, what do we mean by mental health? Um, so according to the WHO, is a state of mental well-being, um, which people cope with the many stressors in their life. Okay, they can have their own way of coping, functioning, and being productive. Doesn't mean necessarily to be cured of symptoms. I think this is very important in the concept of what we mean by uh, mental health. So someone with a mental health lived experience, the idea is how they can be independent, how they can cope with themselves and feeling better. Not necessarily, we don't foresee necessary that some conditions will have no symptoms, for example. So in, um, in, a, in emergency settings, it's good to remind that um, in a, a humanitarian field in emergencies, after emergencies, majority of people will face situations of traumatic experience and psychological distress, but the majority also improve with the time and they find own self-coping mechanisms. Around 10% of this community passing through an emergency, especially conflict armed zones, they will develop some moderate and severe um, symptoms or mental health disorders. Going further for more or less 20%, we will develop or might develop a mental health lived experience that we say. So then can become a chronic uh, triggered by the emergency and experience can become a mental health lived experience. So it means that the majority of the community will need some kind of psychological support, the psychosocial support, but not necessarily the, the um, 
classic or the, the treatment with medication in mental health. So that's why it's a combination of MHPSS in the intervention. Um, so here is just uh, to illustrate what I said. Um, so the majority of the situations in large percentage is going to be supported by psychosocial support and they will feel better. But the important point is after months, these 20% uh, of people developing some mental health lived experience or some mental health disorder. And in majority of the contexts, they don't have access to care. So what are the impact of those disorders on people? So it's a huge suffering, uh, increase the morbidity and mortality as well. So people with mental health lived uh, experience or disorder, they are more vulnerable as well. They have less access to care. So in conflict zones or emergency contexts, they can um, be more susceptible for higher comorbidities as HIV, TB, and NCDs. Um, so reduce in life expectancy. The, the number of suicide um, rate is increased. So they have severe human violation, human rights violations. The discrimination is higher, social consequences. So in, in some countries where we operate, we see that people with mental health disorder, they are highly stigmatized. They are many times neglected and even punished or even suffering physical aggression in the community. So in some countries, they are considered people with, um, for example, bad spirits or witches for women, which increase the violent, the physical violence against um, um, yeah, their themselves. So there is a gap worldwide. So it's more or less 80% of people uh, don't receive treatment, don't have access to treatment related to lack of resources or reduced possibility of resources in the country or the quality is poor many times, the access to medication in many countries is difficult. Um, and also ad added to that, when we have resources, people trained or, or medication available, the treatment many times are not contextualized to the situation. So here, just to, to show very quickly, I put some um, links. So after who has interest, you can go to the internet, this is public. So the WHO has this, so we work with task shifting many times. So MH gap is mental health gap, is one of the strategies for training doctors to be able to prescribe where you don't have psychiatrist and they, they have a remote sometimes supervision from psychiatrist. We have, counselors trained to provide psychosocial intervention or mental health um, support. So we have um, the WHO have a mental health action plan for 10 years where MSF is also following the, the plan, which means in 2007, MSF also became part of what we call YASC. So YASC is the interagency standing committee created by uh, for the humanitarian field and emergency. So it's a group um, developing standard tools and a common knowledge about the MHPSS humanitarian field and emergencies. So YASC was found in 2007, MSF is part of the YASC and is um, um, in input from UN agencies, NGOs and universities. So briefly said how MHPSS in humanitarian field works and how we follow as well a common language. However, as I said, MSF is still independent in its operation. So how do we operate in humanitarian context and uh, armed zones and conflicts? So the, the main objectives for mental health in MSF is to be fully integrated in our medical setup. So MSF is a medical organization, as you know, but the idea is that we can provide MHPSS for the community through our medical um, facilities. So to provide MHPSS in context of natural disasters, outbreaks, conflict settings, violence, displacement, um, integrated medical setting, 
to be integrated and accessible. I think the idea of being integrated is not just to be integrated in medical facility, but especially to be accessible for the community and not to just having mental health specialized care in a hospital, but how the community can have access to medication, to a counselor, to psychosocial support. So is the decentralization of specialized care. And three is capacity building. So in many countries, we are operating with also capacity building. So an example, Liberia, Jordan, and Palestine, we have, we are integrated in the educational system as well. So we have internship programs to develop in the countries or in the regions, um, staff or professionals with mental health uh, experience. So we have internship program in master uh, university, the level of master in university. We have internship practical programs for the license to be a psychologist. And so people come to our facilities to learn, to have the practice and to be supervised by us. We also deliver lectures. So the idea is uh, supporting uh, the, 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 the region to develop um, new psychiatrists, psychologists, and counselors. So we work, this is a YASC pyramid. I don't know if everybody's aware or knows about uh, MHPSS pyramid. We have four layers in general. So we have the basic needs and social needs in the bottom, social considerations, basic service and security. Then the other layer is supporting community, families, and community development. The third is more focused on individual support. And the top of the pyramid is a specialized care with psychiatrists and psychologists. So we provide, when we, when we develop a project, we think about these four layers in MHPSS intervention. So the idea is that we can target the four layers, ideally. So when we are talking about conflict and armed areas, um, what would be our main, let's say, vulnerable groups to be targeted? So of course, anyone suffering who comes to seek for help, we're gonna help. But in general, we also keep in mind how to target those vulnerable groups. So people with, as I said, some mental health lived experience or mental health disorder, they are highly neglected. And uh, we have very few access to care. So they are one of our target groups. Another vulnerable group is survivors of violence, torture, and sexual violence. Minors without a family or parents, um, adolescents and men recruited by force, including um, women in the sense of adolescents and children, child soldiers detained, and as I said, tortured. Um, survivor of tortures, uh, older people and children, people who have lost relatives or um, with some disability that the mobility is difficult. So usually they are also very uh, vulnerable in the context of um, a conflict. Yeah, injured people. So we have um, two main ways, let's say, of developing this strategy that I, I shared. So we have vertical projects and what we call horizontal projects. Vertical projects are MHPSS purely activity. Uh, is more rare. We try, as I said, as much as we can to include in our medical facilities, but we have some vertical projects. So this one, the picture is from um, uh, a project where it's vertical and it's purely MHPSS. So uh, we have um, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, social workers, SV, uh, nurses, and the main, the main focus is to provide mental health for the community. I have an experience to share. I think uh, B uh, is written at the top, developing autonomy and independence to build together. So, B is one of our staff. He has been a um, child soldier uh, during the conflict, uh, uh, the armed conflict uh, situation event in his country. And he passed through the recovery process. Today, he's our social worker and he works very well with communities and groups and especially children. So the focus is to also 
help the community in how to integrate um, um, people suffering with mental health condition or from some, let's say, injury and disability after the war. So how to also not just treat the individual situation, but how to integrate again in the community and to become independent. So built together is also, this example is nice from uh, because he's part of developing his own community and support his own community after everything he has passed through. So it is a good model and example. And how much the vertical product and many times is a long-term strategy. So when we talk about, for example, recovery um, process for a child soldier is a long process and it needs and it requires um, coordination with other actors, education, protection, uh, safety, like food safety and wa water. So MSF, we focus more in the medical part, but it's important to work in collaboration. So is, um, when we are talking about uh, armed and conflicts and zones, it's highly needed to be integrated and coordinate um, a pathway, a referral system for the fully recover, recovery, full recovery. Then we have horizontal programs. So this picture is from Middle East. Um, from a project of uh, surgical and reconstructive um, uh, activities. So we have children and adults, people um, injured by the war, so burn and amputation many times, or injuries that requires many different surgeries for reconstruction of the, bo the, the bone. Um, so many times they stay months and months in the hospital, can be very painful treatment, especially for severe burns after, for example, explosion. So children, many times they need to wear a mask for compression when they have face uh, the face burn. Um, so this is horizontal integrated program in a sense that we have the surgical hospital. This, so we have surgeons, doctors, physiotherapists, but then we also have mental health integrated with psychologists and psychiatrists for the top of the pyramid intervention. But we also have psychosocial support for the kids, for the family. We have an entire school inside the hospital because the, the patients come from different countries. So they are um, um, displaced or migrants. So they come from different countries. And they stayed, they live in the hospital during the surgeries. So the kids, many times, they are they stop to go to the school. So we have an entire school with a teacher. We have what we call animator. So it's a social activity to have the kids involved in activities, adults to have activities as well. So it's a full patch peer counselor. So we have peers, so we have patients who passed through the same situation, but they are. Um, in a longer term of recovery, so they are um, more advanced, let's say, in their treatment, who are trained and supervised to provide support for other patients. So the peer counseling is a very interesting strategy in our programs, in a psychosocial intervention. So for pain management, it works very well. So the integrated activity uh, means a multidisciplinary aspect of the intervention. So here is just a summary, like the main needs. Um, we have, as I said, individual level and family and community level. Um, many times we also need to work with community. The community is also facing all the traumatic experience and history. So we need many times to work with religious leaders in collaboration to help the support of the community, uh, schools, universities, um, as much as we can to build this um, support from the community. So we have health promoters, mental health, psychosocials, um, community workers in the community to have this link between the individual and the integration and reintegration. So based in the YASC uh, guidelines and also um, what I've said, it's highly important to work with coordinating among actors. 
So health sector protection, education, uh, organizations, government. So is an important part when we operate in a country to have those um, collaborations, discussions and working um, together. So clusters. So when we, when we work in the field, the person in charge of mental health project is also the one who is going to be involved in all these negotiations. So it's very it's an important part for advocacy, for a strategy um, included in our strategy. And it is uh, interesting because many times at the university as a psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker, we don't learn how to do that. So when we come to the humanitarian field, is something that we need to develop. So it's, it's part of the, the capacity building as well in our team to develop those skills of coordinating, collaborating, advocacy. And MHPSS is a cross-sector uh, technical working group. So it's a cross-cluster, which means that we are involved in any demand. So you have the health sector, but MHPSS is crossing. We work with education, we have MHPSS in also protection, for example, for SV or children, um, for example, Libya uh, context where we are operating. We have a legal officer involved with MHPSS for protection for the, the cases. So it's a cross cluster group. Uh, and uh, MHPSS is cross-cluster, and it's very important to, to be aware of all those interventions that we can cope together. And it's also important, so we are talking about more government organizations, but it's also important to think about support circles, the child or the individual, family, extended family, community and government, and how much MHPSS uh, is involved in all those layers. So another example, um, a child uh, who faces a situation with a bomb and is burned. So it's all the support for the child, but how the family needs to learn in how to support the child with the, the treatment and then after how this child is going to go to the community, be um, supported enough to handle with the stigma because you know, the burn is very uh, visible. So the community sometimes have reactions, the child can be uh, stigmatized. So how to work as well with the community, the school to receive this child back. In Liberia, for example, we have a uh, program with epilepsy and many children at the beginning, they were uh, banned from the school. They were, um, they couldn't study anymore. So we had to work with the school in sensitizing that they were thinking that epilepsy can be contagious. So this health promotion as well, like how the community can understand what is epilepsy that is not contagious, how to support this child to, to be back to the school. And because it's a, um, the right of the kid, human rights to preserve human rights. So it's also about protection and rights. So it's a multiple um, ways of uh, working with MHPSS. It's not, it's many layers. We, we have this symbol of an onion with many layers when we, we talk about the MHPSS. So support individuals recovery is not just the treatment itself, but as I said in the beginning about well-being, all the process of uh, recovery. So it's a process of rehumanizing. So during a armed conflict or a war context, a lot of the rights were disrespect people are dehumanized by the, 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 the system. So it's a rehumanizing process. Have the, uh, the recognition that they can choose again, that they belong, that they can take decisions by themselves again. Um, communication, leading with the grief, with um, all the process of loss in many cases. Planning with. So the treatment and the recovery is also um, what they want. Many times, as I said, is not fully the, the cure of the symptoms, but the sense of control, but maybe what is possible, how to work with this condition from now on, how to live with this situation from now on. 
So collaboration between different services, as I said, and their integration process. So it's a full package from the beginning, the treatment and the recovery. And I will open for questions because yeah, the time is finishing. Thank you. I, I will leave here my email if someone wants to contact us and MSF contact as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. The presentation was excellent. I think for mental health support, there are a lot of stakeholders and it's a long-term effort that requires treatment and also a lot of conversations and collaboration. Mm -hmm. There are some questions that we received through the chat as well, that seems to be quite relevant. If we look at the chat questions, the mental health support efforts of MSF after they're completed, are there any kind of programs with the local health agencies or local NGOs in the long term, if there are cases that you need to hand over the activities, or if there are agencies that need to take over for mental health support, there would be a transition process. So I'm curious about that. Would it be possible to an provide an answer to that question? Sure. That's a good question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. So MSF is an emergency medical organization, right? So as a main focus is targeting emergency, not necessarily developing entire MHPSS in a country. We are changing. We have more what we call regular projects than emergencies nowadays. So because the conflict is also changing many countries. But in general, the idea is to go to provide care and many times we leave, is true. So the handover process is super important, uh, especially MHPSS because uh, for example, the recovery, as you said, recovery takes a long time. And if you have, I'll give the example of this staff from Liberia, a children, a child soldier. If you disrupt the recovery process, it can be a re-traumatizing uh, process for the, the individual and many of them they go back to the situation right if they don't have the support so it's really important to have the continuity and since the beginning of the strategy of intervention to think about sustainability so we are improving a lot in uh, MSF I'm not saying that we are perfect we are we have it in mind and we try more and more to think about sustainability so we have some options in some countries when we are leaving, because for example, was a medical intervention we leave, so MHPSS is gonna leave as well. We try to hand over or for MOH or another actor with a period of handover. So ERA, for, I will give you the, the, the example of Iran that right now MSF is leaving the project. So MOH after years, they have more resources now to take over. So we are providing six months of supervision. So we deliver all the activity and we follow them with supervision for six months to make sure that, okay, now they have, they took over entire activity, they handle the patients and then we fully leave. So we, we leave in steps. We leave first with the staff, then we leave, we just stay for supervision and then after we leave completely. This is one of the ways. Sometimes we have an entire organization who can take over, which then sometimes is easier if they have already MHPSS. But that's more tricky in the humanitarian field, as I share, is more difficult to have resources in mental health. So there are countries that we operate that there is no psychologist or psychiatrist. So how we can hand over a project with psychotropic if the country doesn't have a psychiatrist to prescribe or supervise doctors in the MH gap strategy. So Syria, for example, we provide remote supervision. So it's a long time, it's years already. So we have full staff um, activity integrated in MOH, it's not MSF facility. And we provide, we still provide medication, we still provide supervision until at some point, we think they can hand over, they can take over. Um, 
So Palestine, Jordan, Liberia, as I said, the capacity building is very important. So in, in, in Palestine now we have this system of license for psychologists. We have psychologists um, uh, in, in, in the region that at some point we can fully uh, take a handover for them. But we're years with the university and now with the union to, to have a psychologist with license trained uh, enough to take over because our project is for severe and moderate conditions. So you need a level of specialized care. So we, it's part of our strategy to work with the Minister of Education to deliver at some point, to hand over at some point. So you have different ways and sometimes in between sections. So for example, right now in one of our countries in Ukraine, OCP, the French section is leaving, but is fully uh, handing over the project for OCG. So it's Geneva section in MSF. So it's also a way to, to make sure that the project will have a continuity. Uh, thank you very much. As she has mentioned, supporting mental health. It is also helpful in natural disaster. And also it is also used for refugee camps which requires short-term support. And how about the refugee camps and natural disaster sec um, setting versus arms conflict context? Would you see some of the differences in the ca characteristics of patients who suffer uh, armed conflicts? So would you see any different characteristics or is there a common symptoms all across everyone who are suffering mental health disorder? What would you say? Um, I think in worldwide suffering is suffering, right? So people will manifest in different ways and they will need different uh, support. It's very individual by individual, case by case. But talking about conflict and armed context and uh, more, let's say, natural disaster displacement, um, I would say the difference that I see in general, and also there is the cultural aspect, the type of conflict, I think a lot can, can go for analysis here. So, but the, the, the part of the conflict zone and armed conflict is this level of dehumanizing uh, violence. So, because a disaster is a disaster. So there is the suffering, there is the loss, there is sometimes injure, but is there is an explanation for the community. We could do nothing. But when you have um, a group who comes um, or try to occupy, or, you know, there is armed conflict and you have this human reason for the conflict, the, the community suffering the violence, sometimes torture, or uh, they, they see uh, other people passing through that, a child who see their parents being killed, for example, in front of them, is this level of violence attached to the situation and the dehumanize. So my body, someone can come and do anything with my body without my consent, without... So this level of... Um, experience uh, is, I see the difference from the natural disaster and the displaced displaced people coming from a conflict zone and from a disaster situation. I think there is this aspect that is strong or displaced people from, for example, uh, groups, ethnic groups that they need to leave uh, because they are afraid or because you know they, they are being, their territory are being uh, occupied. There is the same aspect of I have no rights and no one is respecting me as a human being. So this level of dehumanization is really strong and is a huge suffering independent of the area. Now you also have cultural aspects, so um, which are also interesting. For example, in some countries in Middle East, um, a woman burned many times the husband wants to divorce because she's not beautiful anymore. And the kids, the legal, the legal part are for the man or for a woman. 
So this aspect of the cultural situation, the woman become alone without a job, without the kids, associated to the conflict is a huge suffering as well. Some areas where the, the, the conflict is ongoing is historical. Uh, so for example, Palestine with the occupation, the historical conflict with the occupation um, and generation after generation. So there is this, this um, historical trauma, let's say, that is passed through generation after generation. One of the symptoms was quite interesting that was common in children was enuresis. Uh, and so sometimes you have some communities manifesting the suffering in a similar way. So, so when we saw our data, like the number was high like and took our attention. So the, the kids were manifesting anxiety, anxiety through enuresis. But it's not something particular to Palestine, right? This can happen anywhere, like a, a child when they are, a child with anxiety can have this symptom. But it was interesting to see at that time in that community, um, many of the kids were manifesting the same way. So in Liberia was interesting as well. In one of the communities, all like many women, they were showing suffering through the same symptoms. At my analysis, this is my personal analysis, maybe because those symptoms were recognized, they could seek for help. Could be maybe an unconscious way of seeking for help. Because when they somatize medically saying when they somatize, people validate to go to the doctor. While in that region, that community, when they were somatizing with depression, for example, they were having symptoms of depression or depersonalization, they were seen, as I said, as witches, or so they would be stigmatized and even sometimes uh, banned by the, for the community, like having to, to, to be exposed from the community. So maybe, maybe to, to be able to physically show suffering through a symptom can be a way as well to have uh, access to care. But so the, it's very complex. There are individual situations, collective situations, type of conflict, type of experience that can make a difference. So that's why MHPSS, we think about the four layers the individual case by case, but also trying to understand the specific community, the cultural aspect, the historical aspect who has influence and impact in the subjectivity of the, the individual. Thank you so much for the answer. As mm -hmm. you said, when we encounter such dehumanizing situations for children in particular, mm -hmm. the effect would be even more severe. So during your presentation, I think I heard that there are schools that are also run by some medical centers and also child soldiers, boy soldiers, as you mentioned. We also have a lot of participants who are working in such children related organizations today. And we have a question that we got through the chat. So are there special psychological support programs for children? and how are they operated? If you could provide some details, it would be much appreciated. We have not that many. Um, in MSF, the point of MSF is to provide care for the community in general, right? So independent of gender, age, um, the, 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 the place in the conflict, and it means as well to provide care for children, adults, and elders. So when we develop a project, we usually try to not have a specific target population because to be able to provide care for everybody need. If, it, if I target just children, then I won't be able to access sometimes other people suffering. So it's more rare, doesn't mean that we don't have, but it's much more difficult to find in MSF. However, children are, mainly in all of our projects. So we have guidelines to work with children. We have um, uh, sometimes people who are more specialized in children to come and train as well the staff to provide supervision. Um, and then we develop 
uh, uh, interventions specific in each project. So, for example, for example, maternity and pediatric hospitals. So we have the stimulation activity. So for malnutrition, um, in some some countries, this huge the number of of uh, kids and babies dying because of malnutrition, and also the consequence of the the, the delay in the develop cognitive development because of malnutrition. So we have stimulation programs that to, to stimulate the bound between the baby and the mom. So then you have the health promoter for the, the breastfeeding education, but also the counselor for the bond between mom and child, and then the counselor to provide care for the mom, because the relation between both is one thing, another thing is this mom who maybe is depressed about the conflict, about the situation, about gender-based uh, violence at home. So we need to also take care of this mom. So we include the child, but we, we see the broader aspect uh, to take care of this child. So uh, onco projects, there are not many, but we have pediatric onco activities. And then is a long-term project. So the child, so pain management for children is very specific. So we have anesthesiologist, the counselor, the doctor trained in how to work with a child with pain and chronic pain. So the, the activity is very developed in project by project. So in, for example, in Peru, we have a mobile clinic for migrants when they are uh, traveling. So it's one session, it's a, they don't stop. So they just stop once and they continue traveling. So it's one shot session. And we have children sometimes. So then we need to, to think about how to provide care, how to think about protection if, uh, if needed, because many of them, they suffer uh, sexual violence in the process of traveling. Some of them are alone. So, so then we work many times in collaboration, as I said, with the government, UNICEF, other uh, actors to, to make sure that those children will have some support that many times MSF has a limit in the support. So, um, yeah, we don't have a specific project, but majority of our projects, we have children. And in MHPSS, in general, we have a huge number of children. So, for example, in Liberia, we have children, I mean, children adolescents, right, like minors. Um, in Liberia, our database for MHPSS is 63% children. So it's a, a high number in the in our cohort. Yeah. And then, yeah, so depend of the project, we have more budget, for example, when we plan the strategy. So in this project I, I shared, there is an entire school for a teacher hired for the kids. So there are other projects that we have other alternatives. We have, um, there is a one of the projects, I won't say the name for the security because it's an arm zone now, conflict zone, but uh, there is an artist coming to have art therapy with the children. So it's not full time, but this person is trained and supervised by MSF to have art therapy. Um, so when we don't have um, resources, we try to collaborate to also have resources from the community. Did I answer the question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So that was very helpful for me to understand the support for the children. So uh, it's not just program specific for children. So it's part of the horizontal program. It supports mm -hmm. moms um, and involving mm -hmm. children, uh, involving teachers, involving artists. So mm -hmm. various people are involved in this support process. Okay, that was very helpful to understand. So we just talked about the horizontal program and we have a question from the participant. So I have a question about a vertical program. Mm -hmm. So for example, not just a psychiatrist, there are psychologists, social workers, nurses. So there are various actors who are providing the support. Then, so within the armed conflict zones, I have a question about, is there 
how how do you work with the situation where you don't have enough resources to help them? Is there any way to help people with acute mental health? How do you respond if you don't have enough resources, enough skilled personnel? How do you respond to that? Yeah, I think this is one of also the like the reasons that MSF was found. That's why we are also independent. So MSF being dependent, we have some autonomy to also bring our resources. So in context that there is no resources, we bring expert, we bring medication. So as much as we can, we try to develop the resources and in local resources, because if we have like local or national, for example, psychologists, of course, makes sense for the sustainability of the project for the cultural aspect of the intervention uh, but sometimes when there is known we need to bring so what what we do more and more we work with task shifting this is also linked to the WHO strategy so counselors and doctors train the mage gap strategy so more and more we have projects where we have mh gap doctors local counselors and for a while, we bring a specialist to train and supervise them in their daily activity until the point that they can be autonomous. So, and then I, for me, this is not easy, but it's what we do in majority of our projects nowadays. So after a while, we see that they are, you know, they have already reached some skill uh, enough to even to train other people. This is what we are doing now in some countries. Our teams are now training people in MOH, doing capacity building for their own community, giving supervision for other organizations. This happens a lot. When I, That's why I put as one of our priorities is capacity building, so that they give supervision for counselors in MOH, for example. So it's our own long long process of capacity building, but we do that. I think the most difficult part is medication. It's not the majority of our cohort. As I said, it's more or less 20% of a group, let's say, or um, community passing through the situation that is gonna need proper medication. But some medication for, let's say, depression is sometimes easier to find. But the most specialized medication for mental health, lived experience, mental health condition, many countries are not available at all. And then MSF brings it, imports it. So, and that's for me, the access to medication is a huge, is a big campaign for many years in MSF. And is not just related to, let's say, the general classic medical, but also mental health medical care. This is the most difficult because in some countries, we are bringing the medication, porting the medication, and then even if we have people after a while skilled enough to take over, the country cannot take over the medication. So if we leave, there is a disruption of the psychotropic. So until the point of MOH to be resourced, let's say enough to take over the psychotropic in the country, we still need to support with uh, the medication. So it means we also need to focus in advocacy. So in some countries we work with MOH in advocacy uh, for them to have access to medication as well. So yeah, I think, so we work with task shifting, local and national staff training and supervising them. And uh, yeah, and sometimes we in many, zone areas we need to import medication. I think this is the most difficult part. Yes, you mentioned that MSF is independent in its operations. And when the workers in the field, when they observe things happening in the field, then we have the medical medication experts, and we also have the trained experts in logistics, in managing the medication. So if there are cases that there are shortage of medication, we have the capability to distribute them if necessary. MSF Korea also always is trying to recruit a lot of field workers at MSF. 
So if you actually are interested in signing up as a mental health advisor, I think that would be more than appreciated. I think it's a question from a person in that context. Are there any certifications or skill sets that you would need to qualify as a mental health advisor at MSF? And Mariana, your view, what are the necessary qualifications, necessary qualifications to be able to be a mental health advisor at MSF? You mean advisor like the HQ level, like uh, or or mental health um, staff in the field? I can explain both as well if you want. <laughs> So not just, I guess, advocacy work itself, but if uh, it's a field worker for okay. uh, mental health issues on the field. Okay, so for mental health uh, staff, let's say. So we have different positions. Uh, so we have counselors, we have psychologists, psychiatrists, managers, supervisors, coordinators. So we have different layers and different responsibilities. So. Uh, so depend of the position, you have different requirements, but let's say in general, in mental health, the counselor doesn't need to have a university degree in mental health. Mm -hmm. Usually someone, we focus more in the personality, the, the experience, and then we train, as I said, is a task shifting. So many times we have nurse assistant, health promoters, community workers, they have this interest by mental health. Many times they are even good in listening the community already. So we look more for who is, you know, with the personality, with the, the interest, and also keen to learn and to grow because it's a long process of being trained and supervised. So for the counselor doesn't require this specific degree, but requires kind of personality and is more like an individual um, interest and keen to, to, to grow, let's say. Now for a psychologist needs to be a clinical psychologist. So it needs to have the BA and the master or the clinical license. So for example, in some countries you have the five years university where you are already clinical uh, psychologist with the, you know, the, the, the supervision hours of the practice. In some countries, you need to have the BA and the master to have the license. So a clinical psychologist needs to have the, the license, the, the, the degree, let's say. Psychiatrist, the same, needs to be a psychiatrist licensed. But for an MH gap doctor, that's the task shifting because that's the point. The majority of the projects we are working, we don't have access to psychologists and psychiatrists. They are or one in the entire country or the ones, the only ones they have is in MOH. So we work a lot with task shifting. And then for MH gap doctor is the same for the virtual protocol. So it usually is a GP uh, trained in the MH gap strategy, but needs to be supervised, trained and supervised for a while by um, a specialist. So it's usually when we hire an MHGAP doctor is more about, again, a doctor interested to work with mental health who has this uh, interest in collaborate with the counselor because um, it's not just a session, it's also discussed with the counselor, working with the social worker. So someone more with the personality to be involved in mental health and keen to learn and to grow as well. Now for managers, coordinators, you required a number of uh, years experienced in the humanitarian field. So for manager, I think is two years at least as clinical psychologist. So you need to have at least two years of experience and at least one experience, international experience. A coordinator needs to have experience in, in, in the humanitarian field specifically. So a coordinator usually we take at least one or two humanitarian experience plus the years uh, of license. And um, yeah, so, and for, uh, yeah, I think, uh, did I answer? <laughs> Thank you so much for detailed explanation. If anyone is interested, 
in the recruiting process of MSF, please visit our website. And if you still have more questions, please contact our office. We have a MSF Korea email address. And if you send us an email, we will be sending it to the recruiter. Okay, this is going to be the final question. And this is one of the questions that I share with Mariana. So in Korean society, there are social problems regarding people with mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. And this is not, we are clearly not in the midst of armed conflict, but we are seeing the problems because of social uh, aspects. And what will be helpful for the people suffering mental disorder in countries like us? When we had a lot of accidents uh, that have caused trauma to many people. So many citizens in Korea are traumatized by some of the incidents. How can we overcome this. If you have any advice for Koreans, uh, that will be very helpful. Wow. <laughs> I think that's a global question nowadays, especially, yeah, I, uh, some countries were struggling like more social, uh, economic condition. But I think after pandemic, many, I think globally people are questioning as well. Like even most developed countries were facing mental health conditions because of what happened. So I think mental health is a question globally. Um, um, I think first is the self-care. And this is nice. There are many also WHO online, you can find self-help tools from WHO, which is interesting. So they have the PM plus self-help. So it's a self support which is nice so take care of yourself yeah do some sports build a social connection with a group that you trust that you can you know vent some time to time that you have um yeah bound um and self-care seek for help if you have opportunity i think everybody uh, should have the benefit at least once in life to go for a therapy um, because it's not just who has a mental health condition but anyone is about suffering is about self-care is about taking care of myself so if you have opportunity to at least once go for a therapy should do that um, so social connection self-care seeking for a proper specialist to support and um, yeah, for ourselves, I think, uh, and, 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 and the physical care as well, because one of the things when we start struggling and suffering, the first thing we stop is taking care of ourselves as well. We do less exercise, we eat you know, more bad things, and then our body starts to produce hormones who also increase some symptoms. So the, 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 the health care is also part of the mental health care because it has consequence for some symptoms and um, relaxation techniques. I know it sounds simple, but when we are anxious or sad or some symptoms of depression, it's so difficult to you know, focus in our brief, to focus, to have your time to relax. It's so difficult. Our mind is so you know, full of um, thoughts that to clean it up is quite a, a challenge. So have your time for some relaxation technique. Um, yeah, so in a self-care, I would give these suggestions. But the, the, the social support is very important because also when we are struggling and suffering, we start to isolate ourselves. Uh, and I think we learn a lot to become isolated with the pandemic. So to, to be able to start being involved, not just working, I mean, you know, like it's being involved with friends, with social connection has been honestly has been a challenge in all the world, actually, after the pandemic. So, yeah, um, I would give those suggestions, but advocate for MHPSS services as well. I think this is something we can do in our countries, like to, to also advocate that it's necessary to be available, is a human right to be available in, in the, the, the health system. So we should have access as human right to care. Um, so advocate, if someone is more proactive to be involved in more advocacy or more campaign, we should advocate for MHPSS care available in the health system. And 
join an uh, organization if you're keen for working with, as we already said in MSF. So you can also be, or uh, we have expect position for people who want to, to go as um, expect to work with MHPSS is also a possibility to join organization is also, who is more now professionally saying, I want to work with MHPSS um, can be also uh, joining an organization. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. much for the explanation. And thank you so much for participating in the webinar. And I'll be supporting your future endeavors as well. Thank you very much for joining us. So we're going to wrap up today's briefing. Tomorrow, August 19th, is International Humanitarian Day, which was founded to remember the humanitarian workers who were killed in the 2003 bombing of the new United Nations offices in Baghdad, Iraq, in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Syria, Yemen, MSF has also experienced attacks on medical facilities, and our staff have experienced lootings of medicines and supplies. MSF condemns the attacks that disregard humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law and calls for the safety of all humanitarian workers and organizations. We ask for your continued interest in ensuring the safety of all humanitarian workers around the world who are working to save lives across races, religions, and borders. And we need your support. And if you have any other questions about MSF or questions about our activities, operations, and equipment, please visit our website, msf.or.kr. Then we'll see you again in our next focus briefing. Thank you very much.